continue our examination of the sport. Today, we're joined by the vice president or one of the VPs of United World Wrestling in the executive committee, 1976 bronze medalist, Stan Desick. Stan, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you, Scott? I'm great, but I just I want to catch up with you today from your own offices in Atlanta, Georgia, to our studios here in Des Moines. And talk a little bit about the condition of wrestling around the world. I think we're probably pretty well caught up on the state of U.S., but in the overall scheme of things, have we done everything that the uh, international Olympic community has needed us to do? Have we continued to do what we need to do as a sport to better position ourselves? Can you kind of give us an overall recap from your chair and from the point of view of UWW? Uh, well, I think to answer your question, I think we've done what's in, what was necessary immediately, but it's an, it's an evolution, and I think the process will, will continue for quite some time. I think we have a better foundation, and what was necessary at, immediately was to redraft our Constitution. We had the most, uh, in, in, my, in, my, in my opinion, the most qualified, uh, Francois Carrard, who's now doing the same for uh, internet, for FIFA, the International Soccer Organization, and helping them get through their problems. Um, but that was a start, and we needed to construct or or fashion a set of rules that were more dynamic, uh, that uh, ensured that the best wrestlers, uh, you know, prevailed, and they were easier to understand. I, I want to emphasize easier not easy to understand. You're not going to have a set of rules for wrestling that are easy to understand. It's just a complex sport. Um, as nice as everyone would like, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're not going to get there. But uh, I think the set of rules, and especially in freestyle, uh, have met those targets. So uh, that, and most recently, the President Lalovich uh, replacing, taking the uh, vacated spot that Seth Ladder from, from FIFA, uh, resigning from the, the, you know, the IOC and the FIFA, I mean in the WADA position. So we have someone in a, in a position who will be, will have his finger on the pulse as, as the Olympic movement evolves and what we need to do in wrestling to maintain our status, or, or, or not maintain our status, I, I really think that our sport deserves to be in a hybrid category when you're looking at uh, the, very, the various ways that they're ranked by the IOC. We're talking with uh, Stan Desick. Stan, we'll ask that you speak a little bit louder for us as we uh, want to make sure we hear all the words that you're saying. And the great part about uh, Stan and being uh, a part of, of this executive committee, if you will, as a VP of United World Wrestling is that the United States gets an up close and personal view of what uh, is going on with UWW. It's changed its name. It's changed its face. Uh, I think these were things that needed to be done. It's exercised gender uh, equality. Can you talk to us about uh, uh, gender equity, I should say? Uh, Women's wrestling around the world just seems to be growing by leaps and bounds. Yes, and it's, uh, it, it has. And <laughs> I can recall back when I was a U.S. coach and I first witnessed the women's wrestling. It was in uh, Jinkaping, Sweden, at the European Championship. They had an exhibition. And shortly thereafter, the president, then president, Milan Ersikin, had the foresight to begin a world championship for wrestling. So, wrestling in that particular area was at the at, at the forefront of introducing gender equity. Now, from a, from a position on decisions that were made along the way, uh, and part of that process was to uh, make a step for gender equity. So, so in um, at the uh, at the time when we were re calibrating our sport, we, it was in the best interest to reduce them, not, not in the best interest to reduce, but I think to, to make it more equal, and that it, it meant that the men's Greco-Roman and freestyle disciplines reduced their weight class by one, and those two weight classes were added to the women. But we still don't have gender equity within our sport, 
but with the Olympic uh, 2020 agenda of the new president, the object is to get gender equity across all of the sports at the Olympic movement. Um, and we're part of that, and now we're trying to figure out how that's measured, whether we need to add another discipline in the, in the women, um, whether some of the men will be affected, or whether or not one discipline for the women in wrestling is a counter to some women's sports that don't have the men a men counterpart, synchronized swimming or um, or some of those who are you know in the gymnastics, um, some in, you know unique sports that the women have that they can meet, or we in the Olympic movement can meet complete gender equity from the total number of athletes that participate in the Olympic Games. We saw wrestling presented over the weekend in Iowa City, Iowa, Stan, at the collegiate level with some future uh, Olympic hopefuls, I'm sure, uh, but uh, in front of 42,237 fans. 42,237 fans, and some believe that may be underreported by as many as four to 5,000. Mm -hmm. uh, Stan, we saw fireworks. We saw people sitting shoulder to shoulder. The stands at Kinnick Stadium were filled. I'm certain you've seen pictures, if not video. What are your thoughts on the promotion of wrestling uh, at the collegiate level as we look to see what they're doing and perhaps rob or steal a little bit of that for international presentation. Well, I think that's always, you know, we're, you know, always looking at how best to present our sport to the world, uh, you know, to the viewing audience and the viewing audience is widespread. Um, and when you look back in the history, the interesting thing is that in many ways, um, our Intercollegiate or catch as catch can when you when you look way back uh, at the inception of the rules was at the foundation of the freestyle rules when they were um, being developed uh, at that time and so now I, I think there has to be um, in, this, in this we could probably talk about for a very long time and, and maybe I'm not the right person to talk about it but. Um, I recall, of course, as U.S. national coach back in the 70s, when the transition for our athletes was much easier than it is today. And it was interesting to see why, how the international rules adapted some of our rules at that time and how, um, how aligned coaches like Dan Gable, who you was know, also the Olympic coach at the time, and Russ Ellickson or Jim Humphrey. Uh, there was a whole host of coaches that were uh, lined up in, with, with our, and Bobby Douglas and Tatapi Hara, uh, Larry Kristoff, I, mean, I can go on and on. Uh, but that transition was relatively, it's a little more difficult right now, I, I think, for our U.S. wrestlers to make the transition from folk style to freestyle. You see guys like uh, Wayne Boyd and and, uh, and others, of course, uh, with some severe backing, uh, financial backing from guys like Andy Barth, who obviously have the best interest of the sport at heart, trying new and different things where wrestlers are, are being offered the opportunity to wrestle for prize money, much like they are in other countries, but they're trying to do it here in the States. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think always, I, I, I maybe will turn if you could speak speak a little bit louder for us, Dan. Well, I, I recall the first thing when I became president of USA Wrestling. My my first on my agenda was since I knew both as an athlete and as a coach that the ability for athletes to win medals once they've medaled once and make the team again the the statistic is staggering how high. The percentage is even when you take somebody like Chris Campbell, who boycotted in 1980, 81, he won the world championship, went to Cornell Law School, didn't wrestle for 10 years. 91, he comes back, medals, and in 92, the Olympics, he medals, he medals again. So I knew that at the core, what we could do to improve our international performance 
was to provide an incentive that kept many of our best wrestlers around. The, you know, I think John Smith and Bruce Baumgartner are, are the pioneers in this. They were the first who continued to wrestle, uh, unlike Dan, for example, who graduates from college, wins the world championship, wins the Olympic Games, and doesn't compete anymore. And I used to have this argument all the time, or still do, uh, with my Russian friends uh, when they compare uh, Sergei Belagvasov with John Smith and I always say, well, John won six straight gold medals, two in the Olympics, and he did so be before he, or by the time he was 26. Sergei Belagvasov, if my, if my memory is correct, won his age straight from 25 to 33. So I always say, if John stayed around to 33. How many medals or gold medals would he have? Certainly more. And Bruce um, is, is a case in point. Somebody who has the capabilities to medal will continue to medal and he, you know, he set the platform or the foundation for, for the thought that we need to keep our wrestlers around. So we started a, you know, a multiple medal fund which um, was the a start, but but insufficient. And then Mike Novakratz, um, you know, made that or leveraged that foundation into a more meaningful um, reward for our athletes, which allows them to continue to compete um, and not have to go and, and make a living. They can make a, a supplemental um, to their living by being successful in international wrestling. We're talking with Stan Desick. Uh, of course, you recall Stan Desick uh, from the world of finance. He's a past member and I think a, a current member of the New York Athletic Club. Is that fair to say, Stan, still a member of the New York KC? Uh, I believe so. I, think, <laughs> I don't want to remember. Just this past weekend, you know, that when you when you win an Olympic medal, uh, not a world championship, that doesn't seem to matter for the New York Athletic Club. As, as, a, as a competitor at the New York Athletic Club, you, you get a lifetime membership. That sounds like a deal to me. I've got to tell you, for as hard as you guys work, it shouldn't be a club you can't walk into. But, uh, <laughs> where is your bronze medal today, Stan? It's right in the, um, hanging on the wall over there in my office. Yeah. I'm sure among your sports uh, collectibles, that perhaps is one of your more prized possessions, is it not? Yes, I think, uh, you know, I think both my world championship and my Olympic bronze medal. Mine oh. happens to be my lapel pin that was given to me, should I say awarded to me, at the, uh, at the All-Star Classic at Atlanta, Georgia, and it was awarded to me by you. Fresh yeah. off the pin printing Not press. Not in circulation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, the recent competition that took place in Athens, Greece. The United States uh, had a large contingent of very talented veterans that went over. It was the first year for women uh, on the veteran level uh, competing over there. We had some promising performances from all involved, but uh, Shirzad Amadi uh, picked up his 11th and 12th gold medal uh, at, and I believe, if I'm right, 66 years old. Uh, I'm just astounded by his athleticism, his uh, perseverance, his drive. Stan, the veterans uh, surely got uh, a lot of publicity over there because it was in Athens. What are your thoughts overall on that event? Well, I, I think it's nice to have that opportunity for, for, for um, athletes after they're done competing at the... Olympic level, they have an opportunity in your older age to maintain uh, you know, a fairly high level of, of, comp of, of conditioning. It's not easy to wrestle at 66. I did the clinic down in, uh, up with some other uh, of, the, of the honorary coaches in, in Atlanta. So I, I know at 66 myself, I know that uh, it can be painful. <laughs> is it perhaps it was it did that color your decision to not accept the uh, uh, the challenge and I'm not sure who made the challenge between you and and, and Wade Chalice but uh, the challenge is out there between the two of you 
And it's not about money, obviously. And surely, I think you hold the advantage in uh, in wins. So it would be, I don't know. I'm trying to stir the pot a little bit again, but <laughs> I don't I, think too many people <laughs> care about <laughs> about sitting weight or myself. I think it's fun See, to talk about. <laughs> anyway, so it, the United States did well. Um, is the UWW doing everything it can to support continuing dreams of our athletes, no matter the age? Yes, although I would suspect that more efforts being put forth to develop younger athletes, uh, provide opportunities in Africa or Latin America uh, with you know uh, regional training camps where these athletes can uh, train under qualified coaches and have an access to wrestle at the world championship. And I think I think you're you're seeing that manifested. Uh, in Las Vegas, right? Just you know, the large number of participants uh, that you have from a large number of countries. So. Yeah. Well, Stan, I, I know uh, your time is precious, and uh, I want to tell you how much we appreciate your leadership. Always, um, you've been you've been there when we needed you the most. Uh, you keep a keen eye on on all the happenings. Your vote counts and uh, your support of our president and uh, what he's doing with, uh, with advice from you and the other vice presidents on the council, the executive committee. Uh, I think we're in good hands. Are we on the right track? I think so. I think the president has a number of qualities. I think his instincts around picking the right people, his diplomatic skills and language skills, of course, are, are fantastic. And so I think he understands what the problems are. He finds the right people to correct those problems. And um, I think we're moving relatively quickly uh, to building our sport and continuing to build our sport. I, I, don't think we'll, I don't think that ever ends. I think that's a continuing process. I think the Olympic movement continues to to play a role. Um, just you know, last week, I represented the United World Wrestling at the ANOC meetings. They were held in Washington, D.C., and President Lalovich had just recently undergone 11 hours of surgery to correct the, his, his right arm uh, that was injured in an automobile accident. But uh, Vice President Biden came and gave him the opening remarks, and as he said it, he says, look here, there are more member nations here at this National Olympic Committee meeting than there has ever been at the United Nations. So that puts it in perspective. Uh, I think there, you know, it's interesting to see some of these countries that in any other setting would be um, at odds with each other that are now sharing, accomplishing the same goal. So the evolution of the sport continues under the watchful eyes, in part, of Stanley Desik. Stan, thank you again for the time today, and uh, uh, be well, my friend. It's always good to talk to you. Scott, thank you. For all of us at Takedown and Global Wrestling News, I'm Scott Casper. Our very special guest has been Vice President of United World Wrestling, one of the members of the Executive Committee, 76 bronze medalist Stan Desik, from his home office in Atlanta, Georgia. Thanks for watching.